All right, good morning. This public hearing conducted by the Committee on Economic Development, <clears throat> Agriculture, Maritime Transportation, Power and Energy Utilities and Emergency Response will now come to order. Notice of the public hearing was disseminated to all local media outlets via electronic mail on February 26th of 2019 with a second notice provided on March 5th of 2019. Notice of the hearing was also made known on the Guam Legislature's website. The first half of our hearing will be recessed at 12 o'clock today and will reconvene at 2 o'clock this afternoon until 6 o'clock this evening. The committee will hear testimony on Bill 32-35, an act to add a new Chapter 8 to Title 11 Guam Code Annotated, <clears throat> known as the Guam Cannabis Industry Act of 2019. Relative to regulating the use, production, sale, and taxation of marijuana, adding a new Chapter 9 to Division 1, Title 11 GCA, relative to creating the Cannabis Control Board, declassifying marijuana as a Schedule 1 controlled substance, and redefining references to it in the Guam Uniform Controlled Substances Act. The Guam Cannabis Industry Act seeks to create a whole new industry for Guam, which will in turn create new jobs and new revenues for the island of Guam. This is an industry that is literally growing nationwide. A majority of the states in the United States of America, or 33 states to be exact, and Washington, D.C., have legalized some form of cannabis, whether medicinal or adult use. Canada has fully legalized cannabis, and countries in Asia are following suit. South Korea recently legalized medicinal cannabis extracts. Thailand has legalized medicinal cannabis, and even Malaysia is now considering cannabis reform. The green wave is spreading, and Guam can either position itself to ride this wave, or we can get left behind. The prohibition of cannabis has failed, just as the prohibition of alcohol has failed. Despite cannabis being illegal, cannabis use on Guam is prevalent, as evidenced by a report from the United Nations that ranked Guam third in the world for per capita cannabis consumption. We are turning a blind eye to this, pretending cannabis does not exist while the black market thrives. This bill hopes to bring that black market out into the light where it can be properly regulated and taxed. The bill will also allow for farmers and entrepreneurs to get licenses to grow, manufacture, and sell cannabis products. This bill will provide adults the access to safe, legal products while generating revenue via 15% excise tax on top of the business privilege tax. This bill will also boost the economy and other sectors as ancillary support businesses will benefit. Cannabis farmers and sellers will need to hire electricians, plumbers, and other professionals to support the operations of these facilities. Business owners will have to buy various supplies for their businesses. The new jobs they create will go to locals who will in turn spend their paychecks here on Guam in various stores and restaurants and other businesses. Not only will this new industry generate new revenues specifically from cannabis sales, but also more revenues in other sectors of the economy. And before we begin uh, with testimony, I'd like to recognize my colleagues who are present today, beginning to my left with uh, Senator Joe San Augustine, Senator Tello Taidegui, Sen Senator Will Castro, Sen and uh, to my far right, Senator Jim Moylan, Senator Regine Bisco Lee, and Senator Amanda Shelton. <clears throat> uh, Senator Pito Talahi has just joined us as well. Thank you, Senators. And now I'd like to begin with our first panel of members who wish to present testimony. If you haven't signed in to testify, please sign in, but I'll go ahead and call up who has signed in so far. Sedfri Linsongen. Paul Zerzan. Bill Cundiff. Jonathan Savares. And Raymond Salas has signed in, but I'm not sure if uh, he's planning on, he didn't indicate whether or not he would be testifying. Right, let's go ahead and begin with Mr. Seth Freeland Songen. Uh, good morning to all of you, Senators. Uh, while I am in the opposing side, I have to uh, commend you, Senator Rigel, because during the campaign, you uh, indicated that this is one of your platform. And now here we are debating with this issue. 
And uh, I also like to commend that you and your coin sponsors have, together with your staff, have made a very good work. You have almost 27 pages of document for this uh, marijuana bill. Well, first of all, correct, there are 33 states, U.S. states, that marijuana, med medicinal marijuana is legalized. And there are 10 states, U.S. states, that recreational marijuana is legalized. That's 10 out of 50 for recreational marijuana. Looks like the percentage is not on your side because there are still 40 that is against it or not legalizing the recreational marijuana. Now, despite that it is a federal law, in 1970 it was enacted Control Substance Act that it is classified as a dangerous drug. It is illegal because for having high potential for abuse and it is not safe to use without medical supervision. Let us check how did the U.S. states that are sovereign get away with this. If you will study their process or their method, they use the people's initiative to propose the marijuana to be medicinal and recreational. That's how you neutralize the federal law, not through legislation. Because through legislation, even if it is legislation through submission, which was uh, effectuated during the medicinal marijuana, is wrong. Because you don't have authority. When it's illegal, it's illegal. No matter what, what you do, you have to follow the process. Because the people, we the people are the sovereign. And the only way to neutralize the federal law or to over overturn the federal law is through initiative. Because through initiative, there will be a, an educational risk out to everybody. That's why we have so many problems with medicinal marijuana. For five years, it is not really being implemented according to their expectation. Because the physicians knew that it is illegal, that you did the wrong process, this body on the medicinal marijuana. They went to the legislative submission which is not authorized to, by the Organic Act. In fact, the only authorization that you have is to initiate a referendum if you want to remove a governor, a lieutenant governor, or one of your colleague, unless you garnered a two-thirds of the votes of the Senate. Now, Mr. Chairman, that's why it is very important that the right method is adhered. Let the people or a group of people do the process. Just like in Missouri, they collected 220,000 signatures. There's a group of people. Then the, and also in our law, we need to collect signatures, 10% of the uh, registered voters. And then you have to distribute voters pamphlet to every mail, to the mayor, to the judge, to the legislature. So there will be an educational risk out to everybody. So every issue will be covered, will be engaged, the people will be engaged. And then in our law, you need to conduct 10 village meeting you know, that is recorded and documented. That's why uh, this, this uh, legislation is a violation, is a gross violation of L Organic Act. Not only gross, but it is flagrant and blatant violation of law. And because of this, in case this one will pass, you're putting the government at risk. Because no legislation that you created, even 
You created the law that will protect the government from lawsuit. The people can still file a lawsuit against the government and you will put the government treasury at risk because uh, in the first place, it is illegal. And the way the medicinal marijuana is being implemented, there's no physician that is recommending it. No. If you want this legislation to succeed and to progress, you have to follow the right process. You have to follow the right process, and that's not only violation of federal law, but also constitutional right because of the uh, procedural, procedural due process, which is the, uh, the right process for the people to make the initiative, to make that law. Because you, let, let's say, for example, why do the California get away with this? There's 10 million people that voted for the recreational marijuana, and there's 8 million 500 that is against it. So how could the federal government put to jail those 10 million people? That's why they cannot do anything about it. They're just silent. They're just lax. So that's how you do to get away with the federal law. You let the people do the initiative. Because by doing so, you're, with this uh, legislation, you are not only violating the federal law, but also the constitutional right, the due process, the procedural process, and then the uh, substantive, substantive due process, which is the right of a person that, you, that the government cannot take away, that cannot interfere. Just like the uh, game Paul here on the island, it's a culture. The U.S. Congress have no business to interfere with the culture of, of the people, you know? And uh, I'm just frustrated that the governor did not raise this concern to the Congress because she promised that she will raise this concern. And then also the taxation without true representation. We have a Congress in the, in the U.S. Congress that cannot vote. And then we don't have any representative in the U.S. Senate. We need to have a senator also that is represented in the U.S. Senate financed by the U.S. federal government because we are paying IRS taxes. It's called representation without true representation. This is the reason why the U.S. founding fathers staged a revolt. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, you know, Thomas Jefferson, they're also members of the Game Paul fraternity. Even Abraham Lincoln, he's a referee in the Game Paul fraternity. That's why to support his living, he worked as a referee. And you need to have that character to stage that revolt. And that's, why, that's what they did. And that's what we need to do also. We need to file a lawsuit against, against the U.S. government for not letting our Congress vote in the U.S. Congress. And also, we need to have a Senate that can represent us in the U.S. Senate that can, can also vote. That's why, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I hope that uh, you will, uh, you will uh, reconsider this bill and uh, reminds me of the quote of Neil uh, Blumenthal. It's not the amount of wealth or money that you accumulated or the profit that you gain. It is the impact and change that you created. I know you're trying to make a change, but let's do it right. And I hope I was able to make an impact that will change the uh, position of, of you and your co-sponsors. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nsongan, for your testimony. <clears throat> Just to clarify a couple of uh, things you mentioned quickly, um, with regards to uh, its relation to the Organic Act, I did check with the Legislative Legal Council, and it's their opinion that we are okay to proceed with this bill, um, that it's not in violation of the Organic Act, and that's our Legal Council's opinion. In addition to that, um, with regards to the states that have legalized it via referendum, that is correct. There are <clears throat> many that have. However, there are some states who have begun legalizing it through, the, through their legislatures. In fact, I believe, I don't remember which state offhand, but I think it may be the state of Vermont. I could be incorrect, but I remember at least one or two states have legalized it uh, via their state legislatures. So just to clarify those um, two issues. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I, I respect your uh, opinion, but just like, as, like, just like what I said, that's only an opinion of the uh, Legislative Council. The right jurisdiction for this is the federal court that has the judicial power on equity and laws arising from the federal law, constitution, and treaties of the United States because 
this federal law, constitution, and treaty that take precedent or priority over the territory law or the Guam law. And, uh, and also, I'd like to add that all those 33 states and 10 states, they all use the initiative process. That's what that, I'm that, that, saying not, is not, incorrect. Not the there actually process. is, there is at least one state that has uh, legalized via the state legislature. Uh, that, uh, that's thank, not thank opinion, you, that's fact. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Nsongen. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, uh, and... Excuse uh, me, sir. Uh, just uh, one minute, this one is just very important uh, from the scientists. Just, just give me one minute, please. Sure, this is relative thank to you. the bill. Uh, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Ruben Baller, health scientist at National Institute or on drug abuse, much of concern is with young people who use the drug because drug interfere with the development of the brain while it's still maturing. Smoking marijuana interferes with connection being made in the brain at a time when the brain should not be at, at a clear state of mind and accumulating memory and data and good experiences that should be laying out the foundation for the future. And we got to remember the youth, the young, that is the hope of our island. So we need to protect them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Linsong. And uh, we'll proceed with the next person. But just to clarify again, this bill only allows it for those 21 and over. So we'll not allow youth to partake. Uh, let's move on to the next person on the list. I have a Mr. Raymond Solis. Raymond Solis here. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Raymond A. Salas, and I'm from Guam, and it's been over 70 years since Vietnam, and uh, I, I tend to agree with uh, the individual that just got through speaking, so I'm, I'm not in support of uh, your bill at this time. Uh, I think uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, I think we need more preventive medicine, more education, more public education uh, for the community at large and not just uh, maybe a random segment of the community. I think the entire community needs to be knowledgeable uh, on cannabis. Um, uh, the other thing is cost. Uh, I hope that, uh, is there anybody here from uh, the Behavioral Health Organization, Mental Health? I think uh, studies have shown that uh, uh, marijuana can, can lead to addiction. And if that's the case, then you probably need to uh, increase the budget for mental health because not only are you dealing with young people, but you're gonna deal with folks who probably are gonna get addicted and uh, mental health is gonna get a bit flooded with those people needing counseling. So that's, that's another one. As far as enhanced revenue, I think there's better ways uh, to enhance our revenue. We're having problems with uh, um, the uh, liberation uh, right now. Uh, we should all focus on maybe uh, uh, putting our heads together in, in uh, working with the community and the public at large in, uh, in, in better ways in looking uh, and enhancing revenue other than, than uh, medical marijuana at this time. And that's just me personally. Uh, and, and, and that's about all I can say. But thanks for, for the bill. It's, uh, I haven't read all of it, but just a couple things that I noted, and I think uh, it will be uh, very important that this body take a look at the community at large, and I think the wider education and, uh, and knowledge about uh, true knowledge of marijuana, 
the effects, you know, uh, families, uh, uh, and more importantly, addiction, if it comes to that. Uh, so um, thank you for, for having me uh, testify this morning. Thank you, Mr. Salas. Excuse me. Yes, Mr. Salas. Uh, up next is uh, Mr. Paul Zerzan. Can you hear me now? Okay. The, um, I'm here because I'm a teacher, and I've devoted my life to trying to improve people's minds. Now, marijuana, like alcohol, is a poison. It poisons the mind. It does not make people smart, okay? It makes people stupid. That's why they call it dope. Now, um, mostly what I'm going to talk about are things that you said on the radio this morning. I heard your whole spiel, but I wasn't able to call in. Okay, but um, one thing you said was that people have died from alcohol, but nobody's died from marijuana. Okay, well, if you're talking about overdose, perhaps that's true. But most of the alcohol deaths are not overdose, alcohol poisoning. They are indirect results, drunk driving, uh, damage to the liver, damage to the heart. Okay, so saying marijuana has never killed anyone is like saying tobacco has never killed anyone. Nobody dies from a tobacco overdose. Nobody has smoked themselves to death. But people die from cancer, which is caused by, alcohol, uh, by smoking. Okay? So people have died from marijuana. Okay? A study published by the University of Colorado School of Medicine, May 2014. Let me repeat this so you can write this down and look it up on the internet. A study published by the University of Colorado School of Medicine, May 2014, found that the proportion of marijuana-positive drivers involved in fatal car crashes in Colorado increased dramatically since the commercialization of medical marijuana in the middle of 2009. This is the December 2014 National Institute on Drug Abuse found marijuana is increasingly detected in fatal vehicle accidents. Okay? We see this in Colorado and we see it in California. Okay? Since the legalization of recreational marijuana, opioid abuse and also uh, meth um, abuse has greatly increased in both of those places. Okay? According to the Tribune News Service, September 11, 2018, and the figures I give here refer to the figures of 2017. Figures are not out yet for 2018. Okay, in Colorado, 1,012 people died of accidental overdoses in 2017. This is 100 more than 2016. Okay, more than half of those people, 560, died from opioids. This is a five-fold increase from 20 years ago when marijuana use was not legal in Colorado. Okay, again, on the internet, Tribune News Service, September 11, 2018. Okay, now according to an article by John Ingold in the Denver Post, April 4, 2018, more people in Colorado died in the year before from drug overdoses than any year in Colorado's history. Drug overdoses killed more people than car crashes. Okay, so since recreational marijuana was legalized in Colorado, deaths from hard drugs, hard drug use are skyrocketing. Okay, this is in complete contradiction to what you said on the radio this morning. Okay, now you go on the internet, I can find sources that back you up. And these are the pro-marijuana crowd. Okay, but this is newspapers. Okay, according to an article by Mary Shin in the Durango Herald, Durango, Colorado, March 3rd, 2019. I repeat, the Durango Herald, March 3rd, 2019. As drug use in Colorado rises, so does the spread of syphilis. The same thing is happening in California. Both Colorado and California are suffering from syphilis epidemics that follow the hard drug use, like opioids. And opioid use is attributed to the increase. Okay. You went on great length about the wonders of commercial hemp production, 
Okay? Now, I have three degrees. One is a degree in history from University of Washington. Another is a degree in agronomy from Washington State University. The third degree is in speech therapy from San Jose State. And so I am an expert on the history, for the people in this room, I'm probably the biggest expert on the history of hemp as a commercial crop. Okay? And it's not economic. It wasn't prohibitionists that ended hemp production. It's an extremely labor-intensive crop, fiber. The two most labor-intensive fibers are silk and hemp. Okay? Silk is high value, so it pays for itself. But hemp is not. Hemp was used for rope production until better sources, hemp, the cannabis hemp, okay? Uh, when sisal hemp from the banana trees of the Philippines came out, or jute in India became commercially available, then cannabis hemp was no longer economical because it's only used for rope, and better rope and cheaper rope is made from other fibers. Again, the problem is labor. Now, um, this was, in the U.S., this is why hemp production in the U.S. dropped until World War II, when our sisal hemp production from the Philippines was cut off, then they started growing cannabis hemp because they needed a lot of rope for the war effort. And as soon as the war ended and we could access better fibers from other places, then hemp production dropped. It is not economical. Currently, in, uh, hemp is grown legally and commercially in Australia since 1998, Canada since 1998. France since 2003. France has the largest acreage of hemp production in Europe. And Russia has been continuous growth. Until the 60s, hemp was a big crop in Japan and Russia because labor was cheap. In both places, hemp production dropped off because it is not economical. Okay? The UK since 1971. 1971, been, they've been trying to grow it commercially. And all of these places, it's an experimental crop. People hear about how, oh, it's a wonder crop, and it is not. Okay? The U.S., it has been illegal without a permit since 1970. Okay? So you can grow it with a permit in the U.S., but before 1970, you didn't need a permit. But it's not economical. And the production in Europe, they, they try to make, you know, hemp clothing. <laughs> Believe me, you don't want to wear hemp clothing. Burlap is more comfortable. The production of Europe and Australia, all of these places, the product is used almost exclusively as bed straw for horses because they can't sell it for any other use. It is extremely labor intensive. They've tried to come up with machinery that can make it uh, processed cheaply. And Switzerland invested a lot of money in this. But it is not an economic crop. Okay? Now, uh, so I ask you to look these things up and look at the sources on the internet. You'll find out that marijuana has no medicinal value other than like medicinal whiskey. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel good by poisoning your brain. It is a poison. It was made illegal for some very good reasons. And one of the things is it is a gateway drug. In 2001, medicinal marijuana was legalized in Vancouver, Canada. And they had just, the law had all these regulations and all these ways to control it and tax it and maintain it. Well, the world didn't fall apart overnight. But slowly in, in Colorado, I mean in Vancouver, recreational use, even though it was illegal, started taking over. You know, if you're a cop and someone's got a little bag of marijuana and they say they, it's for medicinal use, you could get in a lot of trouble and waste a lot of time if you arrest them and find out actually it is. So they turned a blind eye to recreational use, and it got out of hand. Pretty soon, uh, marijuana coffee shops were operating in the open with signs, even though it was illegal in Vancouver, Canada. They called Vancouver Vansterdam, like Amsterdam, all right? Well, as always happens, things that our brain affect our brain, our brain adjusts. You take one aspirin, and it helps you because you got a headache. In three years, you maybe have to be taking two. Five years, you may have to go to Advil or Excedrin. All products that affect the body's um, pain threshold, the body modifies it. It's very important that our body feels pain. So if we're taking medicine or uh, opioids or whatever, our body will adjust. We need stronger and stronger doses. Even recreational stuff, you drink beer, over time you switch to martinis and scotch. People drink wine, they switch to cognac. All right? The same thing with marijuana. You're selling marijuana, you have competition. And so those who come out with stronger strains are going to be able to sell their product better. Then people with a stronger strain, then it goes to resin concentrates like hashish. 
okay? And then not all pot smokers, but many of them find out that's not, it doesn't give them enough kick. And they start going to the opioids, all right? And so this happened in Vancouver, Canada. It didn't happen overnight. It happened since 2001. Now, every year in British Columbia, 1,500 people die of overdose deaths, heroin mixed with fentanyl. But every single one of them started out with marijuana. Marijuana, just like aspirin or beer, it is a gateway drug to stronger things. And this is happening in the U.S., the opioid crisis, is following marijuana use. Even in states where marijuana is not legal, because the idea that, oh, it's safe, oh, we can control it, spreads throughout the country. So marijuana use is increasing throughout the U.S. And the biggest danger is to our children. We already have huge problems on this island because of alcohol and drugs, legal or illegal, they're here. Okay? We're like the third highest per capita marijuana consumption in the world. Number one is Jamaica. Jamaica is the murder capital of the world. Believe you me, we do not want to be Jamaica. So claims that marijuana is harmless, oh, chill out, oh, it's going to reduce opioid use, this is nonsense. So I don't ask you, I beg you, as a member of this community, do not pass this law, okay? What's the rush? Why don't we wait and see 20 years from now if the problem in Colorado is as bad as Vancouver? Why don't we wait? Why do we have to jump off a cliff because all our friends are jumping off a cliff? Okay? Does anybody have a question or comment for me? No, thank you for your comments. Um, you can go ahead and turn off your mic. However, I do have to clarify a couple of things that uh, you stated. So one is that... Uh, the opioid, there is an opioid crisis in the U.S. Now, there's no evidence to show that that opioid crisis is connected to cannabis. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, sir, please, let me finish. As a matter of fact, the data is showing otherwise. In states that have legalized, in states that have legalized cannabis, let me finish. In states that have legalized cannabis, those states have shown a reduction in opioid use. Please remain civil. Please remain civil in this discussion, Mr. Zerzin. All right, in addition to that, um, you're also using some other statistics, uh, which I've read that same report about the fatalities, right? There is no increase in fatal car accidents, however, in that state. The fatal car accidents didn't go up. Now, what that report showed was that there was a, there was a THC found in people that were in those fatal car accidents. However, they did not parse out which ones had alcohol. Most of those fatal car accidents involved alcohol and THC. So they were actually under the influence of alcohol when they got into a car accident. It's just they began testing for THC after they made it legal. They began to test more stringently for THC, whereas in the past they would just test for the alcohol. And now they're testing for THC. So they're finding both in the system. That report doesn't parse out the two. In addition to that, um, with the op ongoing opioid crisis, again, it's spread out throughout the U.S., and the data is showing the states that have legalized cannabis have so shown reductions in opioid use and abuse. Um, and, and please, hemp, hemp, is, hemp is a separate topic. That's not what this bill is about. So with that, I just wanted to clarify those few things, and thank you very much. We will move on now to the next person. Sir, that is uncalled for. That is completely uncalled for, and that is false. Uh, please uh, remove Mr. Zerzin. He is not uh, discussing this in a civil manner. I believe Ms. Lazerzin has a personal vendetta against me, and so... Let's please keep this discussion civil, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, uncalled for, and if anything, it shows uh, perhaps he is under the influence of something that is causing him to act out. All right, I'd now like to call on Mr. Bill Cundiff. My name is uh, Bill Cundiff. I'm from Agate. I am also the president of the U.S. Air Force uh, Veterans Association. And I want to thank all of you for uh, allowing us to express our opinion on, on this bill. I also respect other opinions now and other opinions to later on today and this afternoon. Uh, we all have our opinion, and I'm here today to tell you about my opinion. First of all, I do not support this proposal. 25 of the U.S. Air Force Veterans Association members do not support this proposal. 
40 members of the Togi group. The Togi group are recovering addicts. 40 members do not support this group. Almost all of them, or all of them, do not support this bill at all. These are recovering addicts. They're trying to straighten out their life, and they do not support this bill at all. I have no qualms with people doing their thing on their lives. I really don't have. You can smoke marijuana, you can gamble your way alive. I have no problem with that at all. To each his own. However, if what you're doing creates problem for this community, whereby it causes strain on a lot of the agencies and taxes my pocketbook, then I have a problem. I don't have any problem with what you do. But when you tax my pocket, then I have a problem. Bill 32-35 is an unfunded mandate. It is an unfunded mandate, and it creates more liability for this government. You will create more strain, more tasks, to get this program off the ground should it pass. And all we talk about here this morning so far is what other people are doing. There is no study whatsoever that you have done that I've read on your webpage about this program. There is no study about how it's going to affect Guam. All we talk about is how it affects everybody. Take the time, do not rush, and study what the impact on this law will be for the island. And I respect you if you do that. This is a quick fix to a patch that many leaks, many financial leaks that we have in this government. There is what you need to concentrate, not this bill. This bill admitted, this bill admitted that there will be problems. The unwritten, the unfunded problems. What I'm talking about is the unintended consequences. You don't have any study about what the unintended consequences is. All you think about is what money you can bring into the coffers of this government by way of this bill, this program. Look at section, your, your legislative legislative finding and intent. It says, and this is the proof of the problems you just admitted with this, problem, with this program. It says, the legislature in Guam finds that the interest of enhancing revenue for public purposes with the creation of a new industry, enhancing individual freedom, and promoting the efficient use of law, enforcing resources, the use of cannabis should be legal for persons 21 year, years of age and older, and the production, this is so confusing, and the production and sale of cannabis should be regulated for public health, welfare, safety, and taxation purposes. What? This is so confusing. What are you talking about? What you've just admitted is that you have unintended consequences. What does regulated mean? Regulated means to control. But what do you want to control? Why would you want to control public health? What do you want to regulate public health? What do you want to re why do you want to regulate safety and welfare? Why? The unintended consequences is there. You must admit that. You ignore the, you ignore the major crisis, the major risk. You're adding fuel to the fire. That I do not see anywhere in this law, anywhere in this law, that instructs the other agencies where people may have to go if they have a problem with, 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 with cannabis. I don't see any part of this law that instructs to collect data, to collect data to see if there are marijuana problems related 
to this, to this law. I don't see any data. I don't see anybody being instructed to do that. So how, this is one reason why we cannot show, we cannot show that there's a problem with marijuana because we have no data here. We have no future data to say that there's a problem. Nothing, nothing whatsoever. Other states have begun to look at the data. But still, they cannot capture all the data because their processes of catching the data is, is not there. So therefore, it's showing that there's no problem with marijuana, nothing whatsoever. How do you place a guardrail? You mentioned today that there's a huge problem on black market here. How do you put a guardrail up to stop that? How do you stop that? It's a big thing. We have admitted there's a big problem here. So how are we going to stop that? In business, if, if, if I am selling a joint for $10 and you can get a joint for $5 on the black market, are you going to come to me for, and pay $10? All of us are looking for bargains. So these are the things you have to address. Also, there's a, there's a section here in section, I've got the number, 8103, subsection 8103, personal use of cannabis. In here it says, you would allow per adult six plants, I believe, and only one house would be allowed to, to have the plan. That's what, things, what it's saying. How do you control that? If you have 10,000 people planting, how do you control the legality of these things? If you have 10 people in the house who wants to plant marijuana, How do you control that? Would you allow those 10 guys or people to plant marijuana in only one home? If you allow them, that then becomes a production, a production place for marijuana. What about the police department? Does the police department have a well-proven tool to field test either presence or impairment with cannabis for suspected impaired driving. This is the unfunded, unfunded mandate that we're trying to, wow, this is a problem. So if they don't have the proven test kit to, to detect presence or impairment, then we don't test, we don't do anything, and then we're saying there's no problem. What is the possible possibility of negative problem, false negative tests created by law enforcement for not routinely taking people to the hospital for blood tests or urine tests. I was a drug manager in the Air Force and there's, we lost many prob, um, tests, I mean uh, cases because we didn't test properly. So when we take them to the hospital and we give them a urine test and a blood test, there's no way they can escape if we find them uh, uh, with, with dope in their system. To take people to the hospital is time consuming and very costly. As the gentleman mentioned the Department of Justice. I wrote to the Department of Justice and I'm waiting for their response, hopefully today or tomorrow, on, on this, this issue. Is it really, really legal for us to do this if we're challenging court to the federal court? I'm waiting for that response from the Department of Justice. And I will promise you, I'm not a rich guy or anything, that if this passes and it goes against the federal law, I'll be first in line to file a lawsuit to this, for this government. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Maybe I'll sell my Volkswagen. I don't know. So. What this bill reminds me of is 
a story that I once heard when I was in a sauna with a lot of veterans at Naval Station. There was a, there was a brother who was going to the village looking for the post office, but he could not find the post office. So I stopped by and asked the kid, son, where is the post office? The kid said, you go down, turn right, and you'll find it. So the brother went down, found the post office, and on his way back, he stopped and thanked the kid. He said, thank you, thank you, son, for helping me finding the post office. One day, I'm going to show you the road to heaven. The kid turned around and said, how can you show me the road to heaven when you don't know where the post office is at? This is what we're doing with, I'll cut it short here and say that this is very counterproductive. It is a slap to the face to a lot of our professional teachers who are teaching our children to stay clean, to stay away from drugs. Thousands of kids are taught this every single day. How are we going to stop this from happening? How? What would you do? What would you do, all of you, if you found your kid smoking marijuana? What would you do if you find your grandchild smoking marijuana? You're a small kid. What would you do? And why would it be only good for those over 21 years old and not good for those kids? Why? Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Kundiff. Um, just to answer that question, I would personally tell my kid to wait until he or she is 21 to make that decision. Um, let's go now next with uh, Mr. Camacho. Can you hear me? Good morning. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. Dave Camacho. I retired from uh, Guam Police Department. I have nearly 30 years of service. I know the uh, other two gentlemen there. My main concern is as a parent, as a citizen of Guam, and overall, our well-being. Okay? I'm not saying I'm for it, I'm against it. I just want to read what facts we have. I am for medicinal marijuana. I read all the articles on it. I saw all the doctor's reports. The only thing is now, we are doctors willing, willing to prescribe that, knowing that they, may, they might lose their DEA license. Okay. But I hope, I hope it will, because I'm, I'm a product of uh, somebody with high anxiety. And currently, uh, or for the last three months or three weeks, uh, I've been using uh, CBD oil. I've cut down my anti-anxiety tablets, and it's helped me tremendously. So I recommend anybody who wants something that's natural, but make sure it has FDA approved, okay? <laughs> but it's helped me. It has helped me tremendously. I've, re I've reduced my anti-anxiety tablets. I'm more calm. Yes, I still get my triggers. Who doesn't get their triggers, okay? So I'm neither for it or against it, but I want to clarify something. It's called unintended circumstances, as Mr. Condor said. Let me give an example. You know, when the legislature a few years ago uh, said you can ride your motorcycle without any helmet. But you notice that many of our uh, motorcycle accidents or death, or actually half of them, the, the cyclists were traveling at a slow speed. Unfortunately, they hit their head against the concrete, and that's what killed them. Yes, the freedom of choice. California was like that at one time, but now they require wearing helmets. It's unintended uh, circumstances. I don't know if anybody knows this, but in the federal law, if you are participating in medicinal marijuana, or maybe in the future, recreation marijuana, you cannot own a firearm. You have to turn it, you have to relinquish it. It's a federal law. You cannot. So those people who are in those programs, beware that the federal government says, if you are participating in medicinal or recreational marijuana, you must relinquish or surrender your firearms. 
I don't know how many people are willing to do that, especially the crime rate the way the island is, because I'm not. So I'm just going to stick to a hemp oil or CBD. Other than that, that's, that's my point is, let's look at it thoroughly. Okay, I'm going to read it. I'm going to see what I can maybe help our people. Is it a good bill or is it a bad bill? I don't know yet. I have to look at it. And yes, Vermont did pass the, the law for recreational marijuana. They are the uh, tenth state. But going back to the states that, that uh, approved it, they also are part of the highest state for suicide rate. But I don't know what caused their suicide rate. To me, it's all about the family. The strongest drug we have is our family people, and we don't want to break that core. None of us want to do it. None of you folks want to do it. But we do need some kind of uh, solution to, to maybe our finances and maybe some, some other, I don't want to see the word drug, but some, some, some solution towards our total well-being. Okay, like I said, I'm looking at it as a law enforcement, a retired law enforcement officer. Let me give you a story. In 1990, when I was in the police department, I had a very good friend who was charged with narcotics. Colonel Scambelluri then, the chief of police, asked us, my friend and I, what is the biggest problem in the future for Guam? He says, crystal meth. That was in 1990. And we told him, if we don't get a handle on this, it's going to overwhelm us. 2019, it has. So something like this, senators, we have to get a handle on it, make sure that all the participating party, I, I was hoping maybe the customs, public health, but, um, wellness, GPD, we all get together and put our heads together collectively. What can we do? Let's get those guys in here, get those players, get everybody as a team, like the New England Patriots, you know, they didn't have the highest paid salary, but they played as a team, okay? Like they say, let's, let's own this, because this is all our island. That's all I have to say, Senators. Thank you, Mr. Camacho. Uh, Mr. Cotton, and uh, please introduce yourself for the record. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record before okay, you begin my, your testimony. My name is Elmore Cotton. Everybody calls me Mo. Um, I don't know where that came from. I'm a veteran. I was in the USMC, Marine Corps, <clears throat> excuse me, during the Vietnam era, uh, era. I was not in combat, but I was around a lot of, I was living in Okinawa and around a, a lot of uh, military that, that uh, got the habit of smoking marijuana. But I am here as a patient to declare the fact that I have um, had cancer since the 2000, that's almost 19 years. Um, and I'm very, I was very, very happy when the public of Guam uh, voted that uh, they wanted to see marijuana available. And it was, um, then there was very close effort to have medic medical marijuana approved. I was happy to hear that too. I'm not in pain, by the way. I have, I've had other ways of taking care of my cancer, which is growing, by the way. But I'm 83, and I'm, I'm still not taking, um, uh, what's that other thing? Uh, See, my brain's gone a little bit before, and I don't smoke marijuana. Uh, but anyway, I'm for it because um, there, there will come a time when I may be in pain, and it would be nice to have something of, of available that I know uh, is being used for, for that pr purpose. But I'd also like to say that I have a daughter that lives in California who smokes marijuana Every, oh my gosh, she's gonna kill me. Uh, she smokes marijuana every evening so she can sleep, but she used to drink and she doesn't drink anymore. So for those of you that think that smoking marijuana is gonna lead to other drugs, it might be just the reverse because it is a, a pacifier. Uh, 
So I'm in favor of this because it's not really what I would like to see. I'd like to see, I, I'm frankly for recreational marijuana because I think that would be easier for Guam to pass uh, than something that's very restrictive. But the um, uh, only reason I want rec recreational marijuana is I, I don't want to get my doctor into trouble um, who might get into trouble by, by uh, some legal uh, problem. Um, I was hooked on Percocet for a while after a very painful operation in my ear, cancer. I had four operations. Uh, one, uh, two of them went right into the cartilage and that is very, very painful. So I got uh, five marijuana pills. Later I was up to 90 uh, a month. Uh, I, I got off it, I cold turkey myself and, and got off it. But there are, there are things out there that are really, really, uh, 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 they work, but they're also addictive. And I think um, I'd rather be addicted to something uh, that, that I think I could uh, use and, instead of alcohol. Uh, people are worried, what, what happens if children get a hold of it? Well, the same problem we have with alcohol. What happens if your kids are getting alcohol? You, ha you have to stop them. So I, I'm not worried about that. I think there, there will be cases where marijuana would be uh, used for people under 21. I've heard of that. Children who, who get um, uh, different uh, medical problems are helped by it. But, but I believe this is a step in the right direction uh, because uh, I, I'd frankly like to be able to use it myself if I'm in pain. And it may be coming. As my cancer grows, that problem exists. So I sit here patiently waiting for the fact that there will be a time when I could use it myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. <clears throat> I'd like to now allow uh, my fellow colleagues here to comment or ask any questions they may have, beginning with committee members and beginning with uh, Senator Regine Biscoli. So just Masi, uh, Mr. Chair, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank everybody who's provided testimony today. There have been some in opposition and some in support of this bill, but it's really important uh, for all of the members of our community to come out and let us know what they think and let us know um, how we could potentially improve this bill, if they're completely against it, what, what their reasoning is. And I also especially want to thank our veterans who've come forward um, to give us their testimony today. We thank you for your service and we thank you again for continuing continuing to participate in this process. That's really what's going to help us uh, to have the best results at the end of all of this. So I really just want to thank you and thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving us um, this opportunity. I know that there is additional opportunities for testimony, I believe, later this this afternoon and into the evening. And then we also just want to encourage people to provide testimony, even written testimony. Um, they can email it into the committee. But it's so important for us, if you have a concern about this bill, if you are in support, in opposition, we need to hear from you. And that doesn't mean commenting on Facebook, because we don't, that's not a, we don't accept that as testimony unless you email it in or you, you hand deliver it. So we really want to encourage our community. I know a lot of people have been participating in this discussion on the radio and other things. So we really just want to encourage the public to come out. This is a, a big issue um, with lots of potential ramifications and um, potential benefits. So we want to continue to have that discussion. And it's so important to hear from all of you. So thank you very much. Sujus Masi. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Pito Terlahi. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I really do appreciate their, uh, the, the comments that were made on the pros and cons regarding the, uh, the Camry Sativa type of plan. Uh, there's issues that, uh, and it's good that we have this uh, interaction uh, not uh, dyadically, but monologically, and you know, it's giving me the insight to uh, to decide uh, based on the pros and cons that were that were raised uh, this morning. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for your interest in giving us your insight. 
and, and in making us make our own decision, make, make the right decision, if you will, uh, in regards to passing this particular bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Terlahi. Uh, Senator James Moylan, any questions or comments? All right. Um, go ahead, Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, reiterate something that Mr. Camacho had brought up, and that this is something, you know, I have a, a number of questions for some of our government agencies and other government partners, and so I really hope that they also um, participate in this hearing today because we have a lot of questions that we wanted to ask them about um, kind of the implications of this bill and how it would affect their particular agencies and any questions they might be able to answer for us. So I agree with you, Mr. Camacho. I think we need to hear from some of the agencies in terms of how this impacts them. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, Senator Lee. Uh, Senator Tello Tadegui. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and good morning to everyone that came out today to testify in favor and not in favor of the bill. And those who uh, just want to see a good bill put together to ensure that, you know, we have um, all the rec right uh, amendments that could go into this bill to make it stronger. Um, and that's what I'm here to listen to, the testimony of everyone's concern, so that this bill can actually help those um, who, who, who need um, this type of uh, assistance. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. Cotton, for taking the time. It's, I know in your condition it's very difficult to make this trip, and, and I see that your passion um, with regards to on the medicinal side um, and now on the recreational side, um, I see I ever <laughs> to going to something that's uh, less invasive to the to your your body and uh, appreciate that comment, especially coming from. I have a sister too as well who um, actually is um, has lung cancer at and um, and I'm grateful for that. I had a mother, the same, same thing happened to her as well, and uh, greatly appreciate you being here. It's difficult. But um, I appreciate everybody's concern. And um, we're looking at what's best for our island, and I really think that um, the more testimony that comes forward and your concerns uh, will be helpful to us. So I encourage that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Senator Kelly Marsh Titano. Buenas and Hafide. Um, I want to add to my colleagues in thanking everybody for coming here. Um, it is important to hear all the pros and cons that the community feels. I mean, it, it's important to be able to hear it all, to understand their concerns, and then to weigh it and hopefully address as much of it as possible. Um, so I have a, a few comments on uh, ways that perhaps we could strengthen what is here uh, or questions that could be answered. Uh, one of them, I know that the way that the bill is written is looking for the rules and regulations for cannabis establishments to be uh, set up by a control board. And so even though labeling will probably come underneath that, I just want to encourage um, really strong labeling be part of what they are setting up. I think that's definitely really important. It needs to be very, very clear to everybody what the product contains, um, especially if it's uh, been placed into a consumable um, like like uh, edible brownies or cakes or things like that, um, that the labeling needs to be very, very clear. <clears throat> and also, with the, the board, I believe there's language in there that gives the board the ability to look at the books and the records of the, 
the uh, distributors and those setting up establishments, and that there's a representative from Rev and Tax on the board. So it seems to make sense that that Rev and Tax representative would be part of the looking at the books and records and then therefore um, kind of being able to make sure that we have somebody from our agency being part of that process and then therefore um, just kind of strengthening that review. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in learning more about is with the prohibitions on, on driving under the influence and how that's typically tested for at this time, I don't know. We're trying to look it up, uh, but maybe somebody has the answer for that. Um, and just making sure, oh, here I'm sitting next to Senator Pito Trilahi, baby knows. Um, making sure that that's a, a feasible test and, and um, is able to be implemented most easily and uh, in a most cost-effective way <clears throat> so that it's um, something that can readily be utilized and, and meet its intended purpose. Um, with those rules and regulations, I'd also like to see that they be established but then come back for legislative approval just to have that final um, oversight by us on behalf of the community to make sure that everything is strong and in place in a way that makes sense to, uh, to us for, the, for safeguarding the community. Um, I'm also trying to look up, I understand that, I believe it's section nine, but one of the sections is removing the penalty for the distribution of less than a pound of marijuana and they use the term pound, because that's what's currently written in the law. But um, I'd like us to further examine what's typical personal amounts to be held um, in, in other models in the NMI, in other states. Um, I may be incorrect. A pound seems like an awful lot for personal use to be walking around with or to be having uh, and holding. So if we could just see if that's comparable with what, uh, what other legislation has as an amount. Of course, not affecting the amount for medical cannabis. Um, that is a different category of use and um, its situation is different. So not in ways, as this act talks about, not in ways that affects uh, the medical cannabis. And um, I'd like to, well, I'll, I'll be examining further, but um, I, I'd like to um, maybe hear, not necessarily from you, but from agencies about how they think this will affect tourism. And maybe again, this is something to encourage for the control board that uh, they are looking at impacts to tourism and tourism, that type of tourism's impact to our community to make sure that um, it still fits in with the community and uh, safeguards the communities and the community's expectations out of tur the tourism industry. I'd also like to recommend that a percentage of the income generated from this industry, that that be set aside for awareness campaigns so that for the youth, we feel like we're uh, really safeguarding them and, and for the community at large, we're providing the right information so that they are making informed choices. So I, those are really uh, largely my comments. Um, I do think that there is value to, to this bill. And certainly for the, the medical marijuana aspects that we've tackled before and that would have some um, impact from this bill as well. As uh, Senator Tidegree was saying, you know, many of us, if not all of us, have friends and family who would really benefit from uh, the ability to access this. And, and I did, I talked to one veteran 
And he had shared that, you know, um, sometimes with the way that uh, me medical marijuana is set up, um, he didn't want to be tied to or uh, regulated in those sort of ways. Um, and, and there might be that feeling amongst others that maybe there's a, a feeling of something associated with it, uh, having to access it as, as medical marijuana. And so them feeling like their situation can be better supported and they could feel better about it if it was a personal use and, and a personal choice. So Suzuis Masi, for all of the time of coming out here, I know it's, it's not easy to come up and uh, publicly testify a lot of times. It takes time. It takes standing before the community and all of us. So Suzuis Masi for that. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Are there any other senators that would like to make some comments? Senator Joe San Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to thank the folks that showed up today to testify for and against, but I'd also would be recommending as the oversight chair on uh, appropriation and Office of Finance and Budgeting, we need to be concerned about the impact to the other agency, and, and uh, Bill brought that up, the unintended consequences and the impact. We need to take a look at across the board, the same as what Dave brought up, we're going to have to take a look at every agency that it impacts. The medicinal is a separate issue. Recreational is for everybody else that wants to use it. And exactly what uh, Mr. Connolly brought up, if you choose to use it, then go for it. Um, the la one speaker, the teacher that spoke, as soon as he talk started talking about Denver, I put it up on my phone. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Most of his comments, I think is. His data must be pretty good, but it must have been yesterday's. Because as when I looked it up, the, the fatality rate on, on, on driving has reduced more than 50% in Denver. Yeah, there's some issues with children. The dropout rates in education has, has pretty much hasn't changed or has gone down, the dropout rates, like it's doing on Guam. But then the question would be, would be the unintended consequences we're going to have the impact in the government of Guam. I'm not worried about the money we're going to make. We're going to make money if it passes. But how much money is going to go to public health? Exactly what Senator Kelly brought up, what everybody's been talking about. Where's the study? And if we want to ask the question of what's the impact on Guam, you can't have an impact study until something happens. Okay? We can use everybody else's study, but we always also have to remember Guam is Guam. We are a captive audience. We need to make sure there's a good education out there about what, what is marijuana all about? Because we know what, what the benefits are for medicinal. That's separate. We got to make sure we stay focused. This bill is about recreational. This is not about medicinal. This is not about changing the medicinal portion. Stick to the recreational. What is the impact? We do need to get the other agencies involved, GPD, public health. Everybody's got to get involved. They got to sit down, and if they don't sit down with this bill, they will sit down during the budget hearing and ask, and I will ask that question, what is the potential impact at GMH, at the police department, at every agency, because we have to project that. We can't assume that if this bill passes, there's no impact on public health. There will be. There's no impact on revenue. There will be. May it be through collection, and maybe, I don't know, maybe the rate that he's got here, the $5,000, to, to get a license, maybe we need to make it higher. Be, you know, and we'll just, we'll work it from there. But we'll measure it based on what they report. Every agency's got to report it. We need to ask the community, is this what you want? Because I've talked to a lot of folks, and half of them say, go for it. The other half says, I don't like it. So, and I'm, and I, and I'm, gonna, I'm a co-sponsor of this bill. And I advise the authors that make sure all the mechanisms to protect it from children. And everybody seems to think that we're going to have people driving around smoking marijuana. It says, if I'm correct, it says you smoke it at home. They catch you out there. My God, put you in jail. Teach you a lesson. Follow the rules of engagement. That's all it's all about. And when we look at the impact in our community, we got to let our community know what's going on, what's coming down. 
What are, the what are the do's and don'ts? And we move from there. And we got to make sure, too, that everybody understand there's a bill to be paid. GPD, everything. Okay, so with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator Sonagasin. Senator Kelly marsh Titano, you had something else to add? Sizu uh, Masi. Um, I do have a couple more questions. And so I think, again, in light of strengthening the bill, uh, to make sure there's language in there that addresses those that are already serving time um, and how that will be addressed. Um, and then also to look at, um, you know, I know that we've all talked about getting some input from agencies, but to make sure that we understand how this affects both employer and employee rights. Um, so if we could be looking at that as a body or the authors uh, writing that as well. Thanks, Senator. Just to clarify, um, the bill preserves the employer's rights to set their drug play workplace policies. Um, thank you, gentlemen. I'd like to call up the next, uh, if there's no other senators with any other questions or comments, I'd like to call up the next panel of uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. August Fest, Mr. Matt Geiger, um, John Savares, Adrian Cruz, and a Mr. I believe it's Anthony Kenga. Uh, excuse me, could I make one more clar clarification? I sure. mention my daughter smokes it every night, but she also lives in California. Yes, yes. Okay. You, you stated that. You stated that. She's, she's in California. Okay. I want to make sure. Yes, yes, sir. All right, uh, Mr. August Fest. Mic check. And please uh, introduce yourself for the record before you begin your testimony. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is August Fest. Um, I don't think it's a big secret which way I come down on this bill. Um, I'd like to start with uh, written testimony I've already provided. This touching on some of the points and maybe some of the points that were mentioned by the first panel and uh, maybe I can come back in the afternoon session and comment su subsection by subsection. Due to the storm, my computers have been out. I'm running on a 775 socket with Linux Mint and no printer hooked up. so. I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, what I did already send to uh, Senator Rigel, oh, let me first start by saying, God bless you. And anybody else that votes for this bill, any other senator that votes for this bill, fraud for the last hundred years needs to stop. Schedule one, out and out fraud on the planet. Schedule 1 says no medicinal use. How many states say otherwise? How many doctors say otherwise? So, out and out fraud. Potential for abuse? Anything has a potential for abuse. Me standing here is a potential for abuse. Um, okay, this is, uh, I'm just going to touch on some things. I'm not going to take a lot of your time, I get too far into the weeds with this, no pen intended. Um, as previously, okay, uh, I sent this on February 2nd. Previously mentioned and suggested that any tax and all tax, including excise tax, should be collected entirely at the end point of sale to the consumer, as in the current subsection no tax shall be levied on cannabis intend, intended for medical use. 
the way it is currently stated and collected from the cultivator, cultivator only, would require the cultivator to separately cultivate or separately or separate flowers specifically for medical use. This also complicates the process and products from a processor or manufacturer. To simplify tax exemption, collecting the tax at the end point of sale, a registered patient shows proof of status at the sales register and whatever products are purchased by the patient would be a medical tax exempt sale. I feel the change would simplify the process and tax exemptions for all concerned. This would also maximize the tax revenue collected on the retail price of products rather than at the lower wholesale cultivation price. Um, submitted on February 3rd, sunset clause for medical home cultivation with its much higher plant counts. This was uh, the bill uh, Senator Muna uh, authored and reamended, and I testified against that sunset clause. Now, your bill says retail outlet. Some would argue that it's the same thing as a dispensary, but either way, if a regular citizen can cultivate this sunset clause in Senator Muni bill needs to be amended, taken out. Uh, because what, would the Passage Act nullify the sunset clause for medical home cultivation with the much uh, higher plant counts? MPL 34-125, subsection 122530A, should be amended within this new bill, 32-35. The words, if there is no operational dispensary for medical cannabis products, that part should be deleted. The higher plant counts and possession per patients should be upheld. Uh, you're, I've already mentioned that. Um, the higher acquisition cultivation and possession per patient should not be affected, but it should be specified in this new bill and to men public law 34-125. Now, the current patient, the way that the 33-220 uh, is set up, it says 2.5 ounces every two weeks. But then again, it's specifying purchase from a dispensary. If you go to the previous law, which is now, I think, 32-237, it doesn't have a uh, definition of allowable amount. It has a definition of uh, what is it? Um, anyhow, it, it, it's more specific to uh, the possession for a patient. Adequate supply, that's what it was. It was adequate supply. And it said no more than uh, a three month supply. Well, if you take the new definition of an allowable amount purchased from a dispensary, 2.5 ounces every two weeks, you times that, you do the math, you're ending up at a pound for a three-month supply. So, just points of interest um, that maybe should be amended by medical cannabis bill authors. Um, I submitted this on February 8th. Uh, Off-island testing, U.S. Congress reps, uh, the Congressional Research Service, National Council of State Legislature, Professor Mykos, and DEA, and Senator Barnes. Um, the past email string reaches out to all. The description of my interaction with the local DEA office, prior research into the matter, and reaches to local senators, and now the former current Congress reps, the staff, the National Council of State Legislatures, Professor Mykos, and the Congressional Research Service, Attorney Yeh. Uh, I had uh, sent him a long email in looking uh, at his work product for uh, Congress um, in past uh, years. 
one would read his work product and would suggest that the exemption or the uh, Department of Health would be authorized. Not only, it is already authorized in our current public law that they be allowed to test or conduct tests, but if you read uh, Attorney A's uh, work product for the Congress, it states an exemption for um, offices or officers or persons involved in the enforcement of controlled substance are exempt from DEA registration. And if you follow that into the postal code, it lists the same exemptions. Now, uh, Attorney Ye did do his research and he finished up. He sent it to former Congresswoman Bordalio, but she dropped the ball, put everything in a box and threw it away. We don't know. Um, the, current, uh, the current congressman, uh, Senator St. Nicholas, through my contacting and uh, uh, Senator Rigel contacting him also, uh, they reached out to Attorney A. He said, I already gave it to you guys. Now he has to go back and dig up what he sent Congressman Rodalia. So we've got some kind of statement on it from a congressional research attorney. We just don't know what it is because he's got to dig it back up and send it to us. But the way that the wording doesn't limit the Department of Health or Customs or the local police to only testing medical cannabis, it would allow any one of these departments to contract with an off-island stateside testing lab and conduct tests on it for adult use also. Um, I won't go into the long letter or read it for value of time, um, but I did send it to all those persons uh, to do, to do, to do. Let me figure out where I'm at here. I'll just maybe uh, summarize uh, what uh, Attorney Ye's uh, past uh, work product was. So this is on page 15 of one of his document summary. May I state, uh, no, nope, that's the wrong one. Uh, but it absolutely this says any, any office, officer or office of a local jurisdiction is exempt from DEA registration. So by Department of Health's own mandate to protect the people, it's part of their mandate to protect the citizens. Um, submitted on February 6th, um, micro businesses. Please consider for your bill and the forthcoming commission to make allowances and accommodations for micro businesses as lesser licenses and permits fees as in legislation for the CNMI and many other stateside jurisdictions. Please add this to testimony. February 27th, doctors. Uh, for testimony, Bill 32-35, as in other states, it is here in Guam, finding a doctor that is compassionate and or understanding cannabis as medicine is not at all easy to come by. An excellent, this is an excellent reasoning for this bill, 32-35. Everybody's having to play hide and seek with a doctor and the doctors are uninformed what's been on the books from the Supreme Court since 2003. They cannot lose their license, can't be penalized, DEA registration or otherwise just for merely recommending cannabis to a patient. And in our law, our form from the Department of Health, it's not even a recommendation. It's merely a certification. It's the, the doctor's only certifying that he has a bona fide relationship with the patient 
And in his opinion, the patient has a qualified condition and he believes in the potential health benefits, not proven health benefits, just potential health benefits. And he also testifying that he believes that it may uh, likely would outweigh the risks uh, to, the, the, to, to the patients. So what he's only saying is he has a potential likely belief. Now, if you certify, testify and state that you believe in God, that's not the same thing as you recommending someone to go to church. Two different things. He's only testifying that we have a relationship, he's got a condition, it possibly may help him, and it probably won't hurt this particular patient. His doctor is not stating that he's recommending anything. There's no word recommendation in his statement. Um, that's it for my written testimony I've already submitted to uh, Senator Rigel. Uh, if I can briefly comment on the last panel's uh, testimonies, uh, I will, if I can come back in the afternoon session and I'll study the bill further, make notes and make quick comments. Um, I didn't catch the first citizen's name that when I walked in, but uh, he's talking about scientific studies on brain development. If you look at the studies he refers to and anything in the uh, National uh, Center for Biotechnical Information, when you look at these studies, and I've noticed this since I started studying medicine for my own conditions, when you, when you look at the doctors, it's almost like legal ease. They use words like may, could, suggest, and possibly. What Zerzan and the other um, gentlemen, when, when they were saying about these studies, you got to read between the lines. They're not saying, yes, this is true, this is positive, this is what's going to happen. It may be. It could be. It suggests. The language is very suggestive. <clears throat> Paul Zerzan. Um, sorry, um, is this brazen BS? Excuse me, the study from Colorado. No causation with the studies with the, uh, the driving and the fatalities and everything like that. If you consume potent cannabis right now today, 28 days from now, you're going to test positive. And that's the problem with these drug tests and urine testing for employment. They're not testing for active tetrahydrocannabinol. What they're getting is once your brain absorbs, the synapses absorbs the THC, it leaves a byproduct. So it's like a campfire. You have a campfire. Yes, there's a campfire. That's burning. It's got active constituents to it. Two days later, you have a pile of ashes there. That's not a campfire. That's not active. So in your blood and uh, your urine, what, what gets stored in your fat cells is the byproduct of your brain absorbing or using the THC. So you're, you're seeing residual byproducts. You're seeing waste products. So it's not active. So any of these studies that show a correlation, they, they don't actually show a correlation. They just said, well, they had THC. Again, you consume some potent cannabis, if you can find some. Um, 28 days later, only the bribe products are going to show up in your urine test. It has no effect on your performance whatsoever. Um, 
He also mentioned something about hemp, and it's not uh, a good thing. Um, oh, one thing Paul Thursday said. I, increase in syphilis because of cannabis use. Really? Come on. How, how do you even make that correlation? Um, hemp, I would say, uses less pesticide. He was downplaying the hemp industry. Uh, you got less chemical pesticides and uh, versus nylon or plastic products. That's all done by chemical process. Hemp is much more organic and friendly to the environment. So we got the brainwash trying to brainwash us. Yeah, this brainwashing thing has been going on for about 100 years now. Um, there are no gateways. There are only choices. Period. This is just the rhetoric of the paranoid prohibitionists. And I hear people say, you know, with smoking marijuana, you're going to become paranoid. I say it's the prohibitionists that are exhibiting paranoia. Foaming at the mouth paranoia. <sighs> Mr. Cotton, um, he made a good point. It leads away from alcohol and opiates, and it's, a, it's an alternative. It's an alternative. It's a very safe alternative. Uh, I know for myself, I haven't consumed a drop of alcohol since, I didn't keep track of it, but I think it was 2000 or 2001. I did not replace it with cannabis because I was already a cannabis user. So there was no replacement. I just took alcohol out of my consumption diet. I didn't replace it with cannabis because I was already a big fan of cannabis anyhow. I didn't increase my use of cannabis, but it was something that would allow me to stay away from alcohol it's a safe alternative, you know. If you can spend your money on something that's as pleasant as cannabis, why spend your money on all that other man-made stuff that does make it crazy? Um, that's all my rebuttals so far. I will continue to take notes in the afternoon section. I will study the bill again and make notes on some of the points. I do want to say I know off the top of my head this commission or whatever who's going to come up with the rules don't make the same mistakes we did with medical don't put prohibitionists in charge of making the rules you're just you know that's just a recipe for failure you have to have people that are pro cannabis fresh blood fresh minds and please dust away the prohibitionists and the paranoid people and uh, let's start making sense of our lives. See you in the afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fest. All right, uh, Jonathan Savars. Half a day. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak. My name is Jonathan Savars. I'm a US Army combat veteran who suffers from PTSD, TBI, chronic pain, amongst other conditions. I'm also a father, a husband, a student, a medical cannabis patient, and advocate here on Guam. I would like to bring up some concerns that, I have, that I've heard from patients, three of them specifically. Number one, the cost and supply. Currently, looking at what's going on with the legalization in California, there's a rising cost that's affecting medical cannabis patients. That is something that I do not want to see happen here. And the patients that I've been speaking to do not want to see that happen here. This is a medicine and people actually need it. We do not want to inflate the cost for patients who actually have a need versus a want. Also, the lack of supply. When I, I was in Washington State uh, waiting on my retirement orders, and when the legalization happened, and dispensaries ran out of medicine. Can you imagine hearing about people running out of medicine that they need and didn't have safe access to? That's a problem. 
Number two, the lack of awareness of patients suffering. Who are suffering? There's a scenario that's always talked about, about a doctor and a patient. The doctor comes in and, and tells a cancer patient that there's, there's not much more we can do. Here, at least here, you know, they, they, there's no further treatment available. The patient asks, what are, his, what are their options? And because that patient is suffering, there's, there's an actual ailment, there's issues that need to be addressed, the pain, the agony that that patient is going through. But not to be given an option. And that's what has been, being, that's what's been, has been happening. Those, this option of, this, of certifying a patient has not been given. It's not readily available from, through, through providers. The information just isn't clear. We need to clarify that information to the doctors. We need to help educate our patients who are suffering through with, their, with conditions. Number three, support. No patient can currently go to a doctor and get sound advice about cannabis, about dosing, how to medicate, the difference between medica medicating and recreational, and, and recreational use, there's a huge difference that's not being talked about. The difference between THC and CBD, or CBD that's hemp-derived. Overdoses, how to counter a THC overdose. Literally, the, the, we sell that over-the-counter right now. It's federally legal via the Farm Bill of 2018. No current bill addresses these issues. I am proud to say that I am the co-founder of the Guam Legal Movement. We, found that we, found, we are a patient-focused movement that is currently offers support for medical cannabis patients here on Guam. We had our first meeting on, on the 22nd of February, which was mostly comprised of combat veterans. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Guam Legal Movement. If any patients have any issues and would like to learn more, or potential patients, we are here for them. There hasn't been much support for these patients. And this bill has not addressed those, the, so some support, no bill has addressed support for patients. In closing, Senator Rachel, I would like to thank you for the introduction of this bill. It brings us closer to getting people medicine. I would like to close with this note. As long as we place, place patients first and always place patients in our hearts, we will win. We will win. It's been a rough journey for me. Two years, two plus years that I've been certified on this island and I haven't had actual access to safe medicine. That's a huge problem. I thank you guys. I will be here in the afternoon. I, I probably, I, I'm taking notes just as Augie, uh, Mr. Fest, and I'll probably have a rebuttal for some of these, these, these arguments. Senator Rogel, thank you for standing up for some of these things that are, that are being said. Uh, and you guys have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Savars. Uh, Mr. Anthony Kenga. Buenas and half a day, Senators. Uh, let me preface by saying I made the right choice when I checked off the blocks, but that didn't mean that uh, we were going to see eye to eye throughout your whole tour, and this is one of those days. So with that said, I, I want to share a personal note about marijuana. <clears throat> I'm half Chamorro, half Filipino, but I left Guam when I was two years old, grew up in Newport, Rhode Island. At the time, in the mid-60s and early 70s, are you kidding me? That was during the hippie days. Drugs was all around. Marijuana right there in my face. Alcohol. Everything. I was fortunate, though, because I was one of those kind of kids that I got to learn how to surf at 13. Uh, I was in martial arts. I played baseball. Um, started bodybuilding through my, through my uh, young life. It's very, very sports oriented. And uh, uh, however, uh, I had friends that smoked the weed. And uh, 
I say this from the heart because I know that there are patients that are utilizing uh, marijuana as a medicine. One of them is my son. He spent two tours and two wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, and it breaks my heart to even talk about that because I just spoke to him about two hours ago. He's in Arkansas. So I asked him, I said, son, uh, I'm going to be on my way to speak on uh, against uh, marijuana. What are your thoughts on that? He said, dad, I take marijuana for, for medicine. It helps me to sleep. Uh, I have pain. And uh, so I listened to my son. And um, I, I saw his take on marijuana. Uh, I, I cannot accept that. And the reason for that is because Senator Will Castro, you're well aware of my medical demise. I, I've had medical issues. I didn't have to take marijuana to deal with that, and I still don't have to take marijuana to deal with that. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I volunteered myself uh, to get into Alcoholics Anonymous, to stay sober. I've now been sober two years and a month now, and that was on my own accord um, because I knew it wasn't any good. However, I use alcohol for my medicine to help me sleep, to help me get through some difficult times in life. And the only reason why I did that, because alcohol was legal. I don't want to see marijuana get legal, because I know the ramifications of marijuana. I know what it'll do. So folks that I have heard shared in the last two years and a month now that are addicts that have taken uh, um, alcohol as their medicine uh, here on Guam, let me tell you, it's not a good thing. They started when, since they were yay high to this high. Most of them got arrested, and uh, I don't want to see that happen. I share that with you because I have a, five, a five-month-old granddaughter. We are very proud of this little girl. I don't want to see her get into um, a situation with her peers where Marijuana is going to seep into our school systems, and it will. Trust me. Alcohol did it. Other drugs did it. And, uh, again, I, I know those that are for the marijuana medicinal is fine, you know. I just don't think our island needs that. What I do think our island needs is more focus on uh, uh, making, continue to make Guam a better place. I love Guam, man. You know, when I return to Guam and... October 2009, I was only going to visit my parents for a couple months. I'm still here. Brother Will knows, man, I'm, I'm, I'm active in nearly 14 organizations here. Why? Because I have a passion for the people here. I got a job under Mrs. Ada uh, with uh, disabilities because I want to help them. I, I didn't self-seek for myself. And believe me, you know, I, I know there are, there are those that that want the marijuana for their medicine, I just can't go with that. I'm a proud Air Force member. I served the United States Air Force and uh, got a commission, went from no stripe to bars. And uh, we have a program in the United States Air Force, Chief Bill Cundiff can attest to that. It was called the Personnel Reliability Program. I had my hands on jet aircraft, I had my hands on, on uh, uh, HVAC. I had my hands on the ICBMs. You know the North Korean president over there shooting those missiles off? I had my hands on that. I came to Guam in, October, in 1987, did a three-year tour, and uh, was the assistant uh, um, port operations officer at Anderson. So I know about the munitions. But can you imagine? if I was taking medicinal marijuana for some of the ailments that I, that I would have had, are you kidding me? It was bad enough drinking alcohol. But you know why? Because drinking alcohol was legal. I come to Guam, and oh my gosh, every event I go to, there it is, man, at least three coolers, beer. Every, you all know that. Go to meetings, beer. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see my five-month-old granddaughter. I'm going to walk down the line and share her with you guys. 
Because you know why? I love you guys. I know all you guys, you know? I made the right choices when I made the check mark because all of you were on there. And uh, I know you guys, uh, wherever your heart's at, whether you're for or against, I know your heart's in the right place. I just wanted you to hear my heart, okay? Because uh, I believe that this island doesn't have to exist with, with medicinal marijuana or recreational marijuana. I believe this island can exist with us. So here's Kyra. Thank you, Mr. Kanga, for your testimony. Uh, now a Mr. Raymond Laguatnia, former mayor of Barragada. Good morning, first for the ladies, Madam Senator and then Senator. I'm the godfather for Marijuana. Way back when the first marijuana came to Guam, the Taigo, they call it. It was when around the village. It was a time when the gangsters were big, fighting each other. It tamed them down. It really worked on the brain. They became half a brown. It, do, it does wonderful. Not only to the young ones, but old men who had heart surgery in the hospital told his son, I've sent him on God day, but I give him marijuana. He tried it. The brother, the sister was a nurse at Guam Hospital. When she came in, she said, Hey, you know what the father said? Sister, I never felt so good up until now. Every time I go to the hospital, they shoot, 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 I get hurt. Here I smoke and I relax, and everything is good. Why don't we do it and make it legal? Because we are running out of gas. And at least this can help the people of Guam get some money. Marijuana is not a dangerous thing. I went to the heroin. Heroin, I helped it stop coming in when I became a mayor. The ice, when it first came to Guam, I hope at a time that it would never get down to 250 because you'll never come to the village. It only stays at the massage parlor and Tumum area. When they went down, they tried it. You can see how that uh, very effective for in the beginning. If a person does something, you never quit doing it. One old man said, let me give you five and a half and mayor. I went to his ranch, he gave me one pick, and I make him try. He got the job all day, all night, keep working. There's a director one time said, I hope they can approve this because it's very good. All those people that are lazy to work can get up and go to work. All those that are but nowadays, now it's not the same. Everything changed. Now they try to tell on each other. They talk about people's business. That's not the drug that I know of. I keep asking them to quit. But like a, a person that goes to life, experience everything, can be a good teacher. Because he knows how to be patient. He knows how to talk to the person. 
and you can tell how to talk to that person. If he's a 15 years old, try to get down to that age and talk like a 15 years old. They'll listen to you. Um, here, again, Madam Senator and Senator supporting this bill. No matter what, people that read the book, if they don't have the book, they don't know what to do. But experience has the knowledge to try the best you can. If you can make it good, you try so much. But only us tomorrow and I are so stubborn too. Even if they say two, three spoons, let's put, make it four, put four. That's how we are. A guy that is so smart, when he came to a well, don't drink with this water is potion. The guy that didn't go to college, I don't want to drink that. But the guy that went to college, well, I want to stay with his potion. He might say, see, but please make it legal. That way we can control the money, we can control the people that are buying. Nobody's going to get rich because this is a medicine. And uh, what are we going to do in Guam? All our Serrano medicine is gone. All the medicine that uh, we use out in the Mundak, Magyolalu, is no more there. It flew away. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here as an experience and supporting all of you who support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Laguanya. I believe uh, there's one more person on the list to provide public testimony, uh, Mr. Will Parkinson. <coughs> Mr. Parkinson, if you could begin by introducing yourself for the record before you begin your testimony. Thank you. Hello, my name is Will Parkinson. I'm a private citizen and local business owner and a cannabis proponent. So I'm here to speak in favor of this bill. Um, so brass taxes, the people of Guam are ready for legalized cannabis. There are three things, there are a couple things I wanna address. Safety concerns, economic impact, and tourism, lab testing, and employment protections. First off, Safety. The dangers of legal cannabis are settled science. Basically, there are none. States that legalize do not turn into post-apocalyptic hellscapes as its detractors would suggest. There are zero cases of fatal overdose from cannabis. Zero. It is virtually impossible to ingest a fatal dose of cannabis, and for the think of the children crowd, Rates of use among teens has gone down significantly as data pours in from multiple states. According to an article from Psychology Today, the reality is that to date, not one jurisdiction in the US or elsewhere has seen a marked increase in teen drug use following the relaxation of marijuana restrictions. Not one. Both Colorado and Washington, the pioneer states of marijuana legalization, have actually seen drops in teen marijuana use following legalization. The drop in Colorado was particularly dramatic. Despite the wave of legalization, nationwide teen drug use is at a 20-year low. In fact, if you really want to see teen usage drop, the most effective way, the data suggests, is to legalize cannabis. So for the think of the children crowd, if you really want to reduce, reduce teen use, let go of your pride and your prejudice, and do the responsible thing by legalizing cannabis. I know it's counterintuitive, but sometimes the Lord works in mysterious ways. Second, the economy and tourism. It's no secret that legalizing cannabis will show a massive windfall in tax revenue for the growth of this new industry. Actually, scratch that, it's not a new industry. 
from the taxation of an already existing industry. The marijuana trade on Guam is thriving. Everybody knows somebody who consumes cannabis and it is readily available. And currently, it is untaxed. Guam is not seeing a dime of the massive, massive industry that's been growing under our noses for decades. People are paying $1,000 per ounce at the street level. $1,000. Imagine the revenues the government and the people of Guam are missing out on because we want to pretend that the cannabis market is not already thriving. Imagine the benefits to consumers in price reduction. Many of them are medical practitioners, medical patients, who have nowhere else to go but the black market. If we had an open competition instead of price fixing among the local criminal organizations, not only would the island see some badly needed revenue, patients who rely on the black market would have instant relief if we introduced legal cannabis to drive prices down. Not only that, we would cut out the legs of criminal organizations that rely on cannabis as a cash crop. Help patients, help the government, help the people, and undercut criminals? When put in those terms, legalization seems like a no-brainer. This is the elusive obvious. Even among tourists, especially from Japan, there is a massive demand for it. Japanese tourists are willing to pay $200 for a single one-gram joint. $200. In fact, coming to Guam to get access to cannabis is one of the dirty little secrets of the tourist industry. If we told Japanese we can offer them good cannabis at fair prices, tourism would skyrocket to this island. And speaking of tourism, I have a bone to pick with Guam Visitors Bureau. They should be ashamed of themselves. How dare they oppose cannabis by citing the family-friendly nature of Guam when our primary tourist strip is littered with bars, brothels disguised as massage parlors, and strip clubs. And they have the temerity to say that we are a family or friendly or place like the people of Guam are stupid and we can't see what's going on in front of us. A wise man once told me that when someone uses a variation of the, of the argument, think of the children, it's because they are appealing to emotion rather than logic. And they don't really have a rational argument to stand on. Be better than GVB, and to this body, be better than GVB. If you really want to make Guam family friendly, do something about all the bars, brothels, and strip clubs, then talk to me about being family friendly. Until then, they could spare me their crocodile tears. The growth potential for the cannabis industry and tourism on Guam with limited competition is the sort of thing that comes once every generation. Do not squander it with inaction. Which leads me to my next point, lab testing. When I was an aspiring public servant, I told people that my metric for success wasn't passing cannabis legalization. That part is easy. I'd be shocked if this bill didn't pass knowing what we know now. The knowledge is readily available supporting my arguments and open-minded millennials are coming into voting age. The time is right and the people of Guam are ready. My metric for success is when I actually walk into a store and purchase cannabis legally. Until then, any legalization effort is just a do-over of the failed implementation of the 2014 Legalization Act that still do not have any relief for the medical community. So in the interest of getting actual product to store shelves, I would implore this body to consider putting a moratorium on lab testing until the cannabis industry is actually up and running. We are trying to put the cart before the horse when it should be the other way around. If we build the cannabis industry, the labs will come. Many states have shown this is a working model. Arizona, Montana, Rhode Island, and Michigan don't require lab testing. Some states have started with lab testing and then later implemented it after the cannabis industry has been erected. I am not against lab testing, but I am against lab testing as a barrier to getting the product on store shelves. A product, mind you, that the people of Guam have said they wanted. Legalize and open the shops first, and then build the labs. If no one will build a lab, empower a government agency like the government of agriculture or have somebody work in conjunction with UOG to open a lab and sell it as a government service. 
Whatever this body decides to do, do not let lab testing be the impediment to getting cannabis on the market. Testing labs have no standard, standardization and are rife with shoddy practices. Who watches the watchers? There are lots of tests going around, but there's no standard methodology for testing. A lot of these labs are notorious for fraud and juking their numbers. Why get into bed with a lab industry when they have shown to be marginally effective? The labs should not be an excuse to hold up cannabis on the shelves. And finally, my last point is we need strong worker protections for the cannabis users. Cannabis lasts in the body for up to a month to 90 days. Testing cannabis in employees is discriminatory and ineffective. Employers have no business telling employees what they can and can't do in their free time. Employers can't tell me I can't drink a beer in my off hours, so why should they be allowed to dictate if I can consume cannabis in my off hours? If people are showing up loaded to work, by all means, can them. But if they are using cannabis responsibly, testing cannot distinguish whether they used it this morning or if they used it two months ago. That's the big problem with the urine test currently employed by GovGuam and the standard practice in the private sector. The test does not check for active use the same way we check for active use in alcohol, but it actually tests for byproducts of use within the last 30 to 90 days, rendering the test effectively useless for enforcement purposes and discriminates against lawful, medicinal, and future recreational use. Medical patients especially should be protected from testing positive from dismissal for using medicine they need. I highly implore this body to support worker protections for people who consume cannabis in a responsible manner. Time is of the essence. Once the floodgates break we are, and we aren't an early adopter, then we will be too late. Right now, with federal prohibitions, we have a completely protected local industry we can develop since no outside competition can export their cheap cannabis to Guam. Any cannabis on Guam is 100% local, but once it's federally legal, then that dream is over. Our cannabis industry will be dominated by state ciders and clever foreigners, and our dream of having an industry all on our own will die an inglorious death from inaction. So take action and get this product on the shelves. The people will be Gu of Guam will be watching the same metric I'm watching. It's not enough to pass legislation. They will judge you successful when they can buy it from the store shelves. The people will be watching, and there will be a political price to play for opposition and failure in to implement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson, uh, for your testimony. Um, I'd like to open up to my colleagues again if they have any questions or comments. Senator Tadigui. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for coming and testifying today and all those who testified before you on this second round of questioning. I greatly appreciate um, your testimony. It, it was enlightening, and um, I'm definitely going to take that. Uh, if you have a copy of your testimony, I would greatly appreciate it if you can email it to me as well, because uh, I, don't, I don't have one here for my reference. So I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Tidewe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Parkinson. Uh, if there are no other people here to testify at this morning's hearing, um, we can go ahead and conclude this morning's hearing, unless there's someone in the audience who still wanted to testify. If not, uh, we'll conclude this morning's hearing and we'll continue the hearing. Yes, sure. Sorry, we have one more person here who would like to say something. Mr. Matt Geiger, please go ahead. And introduce yourself for the record. Hi, I'm Matt Geiger. I'm a local businessman. And I know most of you are supported you on your last uh, run with ca the campaign. I'm, I'm willing to build a lab. I have investors that um, we've been looking at this for two years on, on how to bring it forward. And the gentleman that just testified um, with any practice from a burger joint to any medical facility, there's always shoddy practice. There's always a bad apple. But what we have found is that 60% of the facilities that we're mirroring have um, standards that overreach, overreach 
what's required. And that's what we're going to build here is we're going to actually going to build a redundant lab that's looking at volume five years from now because the worst thing that could happen to us would be we build a lab, the demand gets so high that we get back ordered, which stops the, stops the dispensaries from, from providing uh, product to the consumer. One thing we noticed is, is as I did my due diligence for my investors, I'm pretty good. I've opened a lot of businesses here and I can usually fill in and, and circumvent uh, an executive summary when I'm missing gaps. But here there's really no guidelines, I've talked to you about this, there's no guidelines on what you expect or what the ex expectations are of the lab. It's just, it's a, it's a paragraph. We know what our scope of work and our, and our quality of, uh, scope of, of qualities of classification are, but I don't know how to build that into our business model when I go and show the investors what we're expecting because each state that has it legalized, sorry, I don't mean to be going up and down in volume, but each state that has it legalized, the labs have slightly tweaked requirements. And it, I just need that summarized for myself. We're, nobody wants to hold back getting this on the market. And I understand that I would be now, I, I'm the only one that's picked up a packet. And uh, so I, it's going to be on us. Um, we're ready to be up and running in eight months. I know that sounds like a long time, but that's actually lightning speed. Um, so if I could just get, I'm going to try to meet with each of you individually just to get your thoughts on the lab and what you expect. And I can put that into my testimony to my investors as well. But what I'd just like is, it doesn't have to be long, maybe three pages of what the expectations of the committee are and what you expect for Guam of the lab. And then... Uh, on a segue, Guam's so small. You know, I've been, I've been part of so many businesses at, as a partner because it's small and the opportunity's there. And there's really only 400 guys, on gentlemen and women on island that own 80% of the businesses. So some way you are linked to somebody through partnership or joint venture. Um, having said that, I, own, I just built a greenhouse in preparation, I was going to build, use it for tomatoes and strawberries, but this is going to be better. And um, I don't, I don't want to be held back because of the uh, it looking inappropriate, or uh, I have a conflict of interest because I'm going to have a growing facility in a lab. I'm going to get my own product and say it's better than everybody else's, or put unfair. Um, standard requirements on, on other people's. I, I be, would be willing to take myself out of that situation. I'm, I'm fully going to be 100% on the lab. But I, do, I don't want to be held back from having a partnership in something, because I want to build the industry. And I was, looking this, I was looking at it as a vertical when I pitched it to our investors. And um, they care about Guam and they, and they care about what we're doing, but they really for me, I have to, have to give them a return on their investment, and I just want to be able to have a vertical opportunity. So I, I want to have a dispensary. I also want to have a growing facility, and I also want to have the lab, but I'm only going to be a uh, participant in the lab. Is that, is that something that we could talk about? Because it, it just seems like it's so open-ended on what the lab requirements are. And then, uh, lastly, is there a QC possibility for the lab only? Because it's going to be, it's going to hold such a vital role in what we do in this new industry. And if you look at what the lab is actually going to help generate, just on a small scope, we're going to be making 15 to 20 million dollars a year on taxes year one. Year six, that doubles. Year, year nine, ten, that triples. So we're going to play a vital role, but the, our investment's $2 million up front. And, and it's just going to trinkle in because, you know, how, I don't know how many dispensary licenses you, that you're going to have. I don't know how many um, outside products that we're importing. I, I know the edibles and the ingestibles are something that's 
it is a challenge right now for me personally because I had a, a friend in the States have some gummy bears on his counter and they're having a football party and they swear they didn't do it on purpose. They thought it was candy. Um, so I just think that there needs to be a stricter guideline on, on those particular things. But I'd like to look, have you folks just take this away. I wasn't prepared to talk today, but I need help in, in getting this through to my, standing this up and getting it through to my investors. And then um, I'll close with this. Could you, it's very vague on where the lab can be. It just can't be on the grounds of my greenhouse and it can't be in my dispensary. But can, can you give us some other guidelines on what you'd like to see? Because we're gonna make this a showroom for Oceana because we're also gonna have to, you know, I usually, I'm a marketing guy, so I usually do things um, to a pretty high standard. So we're gonna try to make this a showroom for Oceana. That way we can be a model and then we also have to take care of CNMI. And then if it does become a tourism issue, we're gonna to do tours through the facility so people can see that Guam's product is, you know, Guam Seal, Guam, you know, Guam marketing, Guam branded. So if I could uh, talk, I'm gonna, I've, I've uh, sent a note to you, Will, and then I just sent one to, uh, to Clint. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna send one to each one of you just so I can get your comments and then I can have that as testimony for it. But if you could just take all these things into consideration for the lab, because $2 million doesn't sound like a lot of money, but I'm just a guy, and you know, I'm just a businessman, and I have you know, one partner, so we would really need the help, and if we could get it, we could probably get it up in eight to 10 months. Thank you very much, Mr. Geiger, for your testimony. Um, we certainly want to um, address many of those issues, and I just want, for the record, if you could just state if you're in support or in opposition to this oh, bill. Oh, no, I, I've been in support for a long time. I just didn't know how to help. And then it just seemed like over the last year that the lab was a sticking point. So I went in to go get the packet for the lab and they were, they were shocked. And they said, you sure you want the lab? And I said, yeah. And I said, how many people have picked up the packet? And they said, you're the, the only one. one on the list. So I thought that it was it's something also, that we can do. It's also my understanding that the Cannabis Control Board will likely give guidance on many of the questions that you're that you were asking, but the chair is is has is back, so I just want to hand it back over to him. But thank you very much for your testimony, Sujith yeah, Mossy. Thank, thank you guys, and thanks for the help going forward with putting this lab information together. Sure, thank you for your yeah. testimony as well. And just to clarify, um, yes, uh, the Cannabis Control Board uh, will be uh, fine-tuning the rules and regulations of cannabis, and that would include also sort of the question you're asking about how the lab is to be run. So Do you have a timeline on that? Uh, the bill does. The bill says that the Cannabis Control Board has to provide rules and regulations uh, within a year. See, so if, it, if I got it in a year, I couldn't open the lab for a year, basically. Well, hopefully, my hope is that they'll do it sooner. The year yeah. is the deadline for them to produce it, uh, produce rules and regulations, but hopefully they can... And the board's, already, the board's already set? No, this board would That's have to the, be appointed yeah. by the governor, a five-member board. And then did the governor say when she was going to do that? Um, no, but the governor has expressed her support for the measure. So um, my hope is that if we can pass it, the governor will sign it into law. And then uh, with that support from the administration, hopefully we can get the board impaneled uh, quickly. Do you think you and I could talk to the governor um, in a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> meeting and I could express? She's a businesswoman. Sure, that's I, something we can discuss later. She's funded wanna, a lot of my projects from Bank I want to focus this hearing Sorry. more on the, on the bill itself, but any other specifics, we can discuss that later. Great. Thanks. Thank you, guys. And I'll, Oh, I'm sorry. Please uh, stay, stay, Mr. Geiger. I, there is a question from Senator Tidegui. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Matt, uh, are you familiar with what they're doing in the CNMI with regards to the labs there? Yeah. And what is that? Well, they, they, they have a, a stand, they've actually set a precedent for standards in the way that they do theirs, but they've simplified their lab footprint, and a lot of them are doing lab in a boxes to get them up and running out of Taiwan, and uh, I'm having one done out of Canada. But they, they've, got it, they've got it to where it's, it, it's a recipe, a soup recipe, and you just follow the guidelines and those really run on who your scientists and who your doctors are on that. But the lab facilities are fantastic. 
Oh, you, so it is up and running in Saipan right yeah. now? Oh, I thought, you, I thought you said Montana. Oh, no. Yeah. No, no. Saipan, I, in I, Saipan. Think, I think they're waiting for me. That's to be honest with you, that, that's the phone calls I get all the time is, what are you, what's taking you so long? And I said, you know, I'm trying. So, so there is a requirement for a lab in Saipan, yeah, which and they they've want, legalized marijuana. And they, they want to, now, now they're saying no one wants to put up, they're, they're looking at a million dollar investment. We're looking at a redundant lab. So we're looking at a $2 million investment with a showroom. Um, so they're waiting, <laughs> they're, they're kind of waiting on me. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Senator Tariwi. Um, Mr. Fest, would you, did you have a, another comment to make? And uh, Mr. Parkinson, did you have anything to add? Okay. Sure, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fest, go ahead. Yes, Aris Fest again. Um, I just had a couple points that I missed in my uh, written testimony to you and one I actually didn't put in. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but listening to this gentleman, I read the CMNI bill, they don't, there's no requirement for any lab testing. Not that there's not requirements for the specification, they just, there's no requirement for lab testing, period. They don't have, Arizona does not have lab testing. Maine does not have lab testing. Many states do not have requirement for lab testing. But on to uh, the points that I missed uh, in oral presentation, um, I had mentioned to you and we talked about how the businesses, whether they're medical or an adult use uh, cannabis businesses, they're not allowed to take any deductions whatsoever for their businesses. Coupled with high fees, you know, especially with a small population, just another recipe for disaster. Um, this is what I sent you in an email for testimony. Uh, B, BPT exemption. Considering the cannabis businesses will not be allowed the normal tax deduction as we previously discussed in IRS Form 280E, I suggest and propose that until such time, these businesses are able to take full and equal deductions in tax forms declarations that these businesses should be exempt from local Guam business privilege tax. To consider the, the proposed point of sale tax and rate is also unique and different than all other businesses. Uh, this proposed exemption is very minimal compared to the denied normal deductions the businesses will be paying taxes on but at least there will be something to offset the unfair rules they must endure until the U.S. Congress and IRS acts to reconcile the discrepancies and unfair penalties imposed on these businesses. This exemption should be included in the language on the bill before a Senate vote. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention in the written but I did send uh, the senator many, many articles in discussing seed to sale. Um, nothing but problems, technical problems, the software, no matter which company you go with, built-in glitches. These companies want to make you buy their hardware to go with the software, very expensive, millions of dollars, and the businesses have to uh, pay thousands and thousands of dollars a month to be able to access the system. Now, with the Department of Health, with the medical, they obscured even looking into the seed to sell. They wrote their own law, which is now public law 3480. They wrote their own law and put in the seed to sell. Senator Rodriguez tried to do a, a save on it by saying, well, the businesses didn't have to incorporate it for two years. We're already past the one year mark after that. Uh, the RFI, the Department of Health issued, 
was issued on the day that it expired. Um, the director, there's always a cover letter with an RFI, and that cover letter has a date stamp on it. If you look at the cover letter on that RFI, there is no date stamp on it. Department of Health has been doing anything and everything they can to stall medical cannabis. Um, but technically speaking, and back to an adult use market or markets in general, just look at the news articles I sent you. Pennsylvania, uh, they had to shut dispensaries down because the numbers didn't reconcile. The software didn't work, work right. They couldn't uh, track the sales, so they couldn't do any sales. So, and we're talking still just medical in Pennsylvania. Um, for such a small market as Guam, even with our population, you know, uh, you can, on the high side, take our population and look at 20% will be consumers. Um, it's not that big. And I discussed the flaws in seed to sale just in the concept. Uh, say you're a cultivator and you have to log in the yield of a plant. What is to prevent you from only logging in half of what the plant actually yield, yielded? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So thinking that seed to sale is some uh, catch-all for any diversion, it, it's just fantasy and a very expensive fantasy of that. And you're gonna to have to do paper backup anyhow because of the inherent software glitches and everything else. So you're gonna be doing double the work for you know, the same thing. Uh, you incorporate seed to sale, the government and the businesses are gonna spend 80% of their time trying to reconcile or satisfy the software rather than doing what they're supposed to be doing. Growing good product and the government being able to keep track. It's gonna need paper backup anyhow until such time as it can be researched. And I did mention there's also free software for tracking. Arizona, again, they don't have seed to sale tracking. A lot of states don't have seed to sale tracking. So it's just something to consider. If you want to get this off the ground and move it and the product flowing and the taxes coming in, don't mire it down in everything that can stall it and cause problems. I'm not saying not have it, but incorporate it in a way that's going to be cost effective, foolproof, and not cause problem and not have it in stone while well, we have to have it and it's got to be this way or you can't do any sales. The priority is the cultivation and the sale and the collection of the tax revenue. Everything else is icing or you know, decorations or whatever. It's not needed. Let's just go with what's needed. Um, See you in the next session. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Fess. Could I possibly just make a comment on that? Sure, go ahead. You, you could put that on the burden I, it, to streamline it. I, we talked about that in a meeting we had last week. To streamline it, you might want to see the sale to go through the lab where it goes there first, and then we're going to already have a division set up to process that quickly because there are so many hybrids that address different medical problems that that's going to have to be categorized anyway versus somebody giving us a product and saying that it's this strain and then we have to double test the triple test to see what, what strain it is and the THC value. If it came directly to the, I say this because I'm going to get revenue as well, but if it does that, you save a lot of time and you know exactly what's going out there. And then if you have people, monitors that are going out and, and checking people's uh, cultivation facilities and things like that, they can get the report from us what we've sold them or what they've ordered 
and then you can verify it um, and categorize it that way, which is super efficient. And like this gentleman said, it saved a lot of time. Thank you, Mr. Geiger. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fest. We're going to go ahead and uh, wrap up the hearing for now, and then we'll continue uh, this afternoon uh, with the continuation of this hearing. Uh, so we'll recess for now. We'll be back at 2 p.m. for the hearing on the Guam Cannabis Industry Act. Thank you.